Thanks, Senabel. Charming as always. And thanks, Waleed. Well, tonight we're discussing and debating the issues thrown up by Australia Talks. We're live from Perth. Thank you. What a fabulous audience. Thank you very much. Now, welcome to Q&A, live from the Regal Theatre in Subiaco, answering your questions tonight. Fitzroy Crossing broadcaster and student Dylan Storer. West Australian State Shadow Minister, Zach Kirkup. Human rights lawyer, Hannah McGlade, the federal political editor of the West Australian, Lani Scar, and federal Labor MP, Anne Alley. Please welcome our panel. Thank you very much. Q&A is live on Eastern Australia on ABC TV, iView and News Radio. Well, let's go straight to our first question. Tonight, it comes from Sandra Bellini. Sandra. Good evening, Tony. 61% of Australians believe that the next generation will be worse off than their parents, which is bad news for Dylan Storer and Zach Kirkup, the youngest member of the West Australian Legislative Assembly. What is the reason for this? Why do we believe our nation will become less prosperous? OK, we'll hear thank from you. all of our... Thank you very much. We'll hear from all of our panellists on this. We'll start with Dylan. Go ahead. What do you reckon? Yeah. Young people in Australia at the moment, I think... I th I'm, I'm really quite honoured to be a member of this generation at the moment. I think we're the biggest and most diverse generation of young people that this country's ever seen. Um, being involved with events uh, from UN Youth and, and Youth Media. You know, young people are really passionate and they're really switched on and I think that they can sometimes get a bad rap in the media. Um, are they pessimistic, Dylan? Are they, are they angry with the older people who seem to have everything? Yeah, I mean, maybe. Maybe. Maybe some people are. Um, and I, I certainly feel that at the moment, especially in the debate around climate change and things such as, you know, the last federal election, you know, more time spent on talking about franking credits than there was on anything to do with substance when it comes to youth issues, when it came to things such as youth suicide and the mental health crisis we're seeing in the country, housing affordability, and we're not seeing any action on those, those topics. So I think that young people are feeling a little bit pessimistic about the future, um, but at the same time, I'm really optimistic about the future because I think that young people, you know, um, we're, we're a really amazing generation at the moment. Great yeah. to see you again, <laughs> Dylan. Let's go across to Anne Ali. Mm. I think, um, you know, all of those things that you mentioned there, Dylan, but Sandra, I also think if you have a look at... if I, When I go out and I talk to young people these days, there's very little hope that they're going to own their own home, for example. I've got two sons. One lives in Sydney, one lives in Melbourne. They had to leave Western Australia because there was no work for them here. So they had to move to the eastern states for work. There's a lot of uncertainty around jobs, around job security, um, around whether or not they're going to own a house. But when I go out and I talk to young people, like the young people who are here in the audience today from the schools that are here, I do see a generation much like Dylan, a generation that um, is full of hope and full of optimism, and I think that our country is in really good hands moving forward. So, and does Labor still have plans to try and level the playing field on this intergenerational inequity issue? I mean, you had lots of taxation um, incentives going into the last election that didn't do so well, but are they still on the table? Well, I think, you know, we still need to look at those big issues of housing affordability for young people um, and about inequality. I think we are inequality and rising inequality is one of those big issues that contribute to the pessimism of young people moving forward and looking at their futures and their ability to secure permanent and, sec and secure work and their ability to have full-time work, their ability to purchase a house, their ability to see the kind of uh, success that perhaps their parents or their grandparents had as well. Negative gearing still on the table? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Zach. And if I did know, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, think there's, I think there's always been an existential threat to every generation. And I think this is just a reflection of that for us. And I think 
like Dylan said, we live in a great country and there's a lot of hope for the future. That idea, though, that there's a number of young people who are worried about what their future looks like, I think it's probably existed for many generations. I mean, we aren't at this point in time, we haven't gone through great wars and things like that, but there's other existential threats that, face, that we face. Climate change is one of them, housing affordability is one of them, and I think it's important that uh, we have, uh, you know, young leaders who step forward and young people who step forward, young people in the audience here today who are concerned about those issues and keep on raising them, and that's the, the way that we get action. Why do you think the survey is indicating that, uh, that people and the majority of people believe that the country will become less prosperous, so the country inherited by the younger generations will be less prosperous? I think a lot of that is probably tied to uh, what Anne talked about, the asset wealth and things like that. That's an, that's an obvious concern, and I understand that, but I also think we've, we've got an opportunity here to, to forge a new path, to, to, to lead a new way, and I think it's incumbent upon all young people to, and, and younger generations, whatever that might be, to look at what we can do differently, and, and I think that's just what's happened. I think there is always an ex existential threat for every generation. I think there's always a worry that sits out there, and this is one of those. Lonnie Scar. Yeah, Sandra, you know, I think that um, the statistic was really interesting that 61% think that they're going to be worse off. You know, I have four young kids who are under the age of five and, and I, you know, I hope that their, um, their life and their, um, the generation that they grow into is not worse off. I think that we are seeing a lot of global economic challenges at the moment and that's probably feeding into some of the pessimism, yeah. pessimism that we're seeing from young people. It is really hard for uh, young people to get into the housing market. So I definitely agree with Anne in regards to that being a, a factor as well. Um, but I think we have to tell our young people, the people here in the audience today, and, and you know, my children and everyone's children, that there are great things that they can go and achieve. And there are, you know, it doesn't have to be that they're going to be worse off than, than we are. Hannah, how does it look from an Indigenous perspective? Um, you know, I'm just thinking about when I was at university, it was actually free education. And we were so shocked when education became something that was unaffordable. Education's been um, a key for Indigenous success. It's a real worry. My son's of a generation now where the housing market is um, quite extreme, that people are graduating, if they can, from university um, with uh, big student bills. And, and I just think that, you know, have we just not watched closely enough and the inequality and, and a culture of inequality has grown? Of course, for Indigenous people, that's a real issue. And we, we are seeing the gap is not closing, it's, it's widening in many ways. We're going to move... Uh, we'll, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. We'll explore those issues uh, much more as we go along tonight. The next question is from Ryan Small. Ryan. Thanks, Tony, for uh, uh, coming across to Western Australia. We really appreciate you coming over here. OK, that is not Ryan. You're, just, just, you, you're not here asking a question. You've just jumped up, interrupting the questioner. So please, if you wouldn't mind, just sit down. OK, there's no microphone on you, so no one can hear you. It's pointless. OK. okay. It's pointless. It's pointless. We can't hear you. There's no microphone. OK. That's okay. Okay, Ryan. Ryan, can we get you to stand up and ask you a question, please? Thank you very much. Thanks, Tony. Um, I'm 29 years old, and I'm holding down two jobs to pay off a shoebox house I built through Keystart Loans, 70 kilometres from where I work in the Perth CBD. Right now, I may be may well have negative equity after three years of mortgage repayments, and I'm one of the lucky ones to even be on the housing ladder. So my question is, what was it like not having to worry about building equity through repayments when houses could be relied on to continually increase in value? Thank you. Well done, Ryan, for asking that under difficult circumstances. Thank you very much. <laughs> we, might come, we might come back to you uh, and Ali. Well, Ryan, thank you for your question, and I know, you know you're 29 years old, and I think your question speaks to the previous question from Sandra about, uh, about pessimism about, uh, and about the next generation and the difficulties that they have. The fact that you work two jobs, that you're paying off a house, and you're only barely managing to get um, equity into your home now. The fact is that in Perth, and we've got a beautiful Perth audience here, the fact is that in Perth our house prices have crashed, and I've got families, for example, in the electorate of Cowley, 
Darwin who are suffering incredible mortgage stress because they bought their houses at the higher prices. Their houses are now worth a lot less and they can't seem to get ahead. And it's all part of the household debt that people are drowning in. Um, when I bought my first house, I was in my um, I was in my 20s. The house was about three times the the um, what my annual salary was, uh, and the interest rates I remember back then were 16% was the interest rates. Uh, I couldn't keep that house. I ended up having to get rid of it. Uh, but I look now at at the prospects of people like my son, who's also 29, being able to purchase a house. Um, and I know that you know, the house prices now are more than, uh, what is it, six times the average salary? Seven more times. than six times the average salary? I think there are many people in your position who are trying to make ends meet, who are working more than one job, um, but cannot get ahead because of that, that, that equity in their homes. Uh, I don't know what to say to you, other than to say that we need something to look at housing affordability that the cyclical nature of housing as well, housing prices, is something that we uh, that that will hopefully one day work in your favour. At the moment, it might not be working in your favour, but that hopefully one day will work in your favour. Um, and that I understand, I understand the pressures that are on you. I understand the pressures that are on families. I've been in that situation as a single parent raising my children uh, on Centrelink benefits, by the way. Uh, and while that was a long time ago, I hope that I never forget what that was like. Zach. Sure. So, well, I think, let me put you, what's the coalition's answer to uh, people like Ryan what? suffering from terrible mortgage stress? I think just one point that I'd like to assert is just in, in relation to Ryan 29, I, I represent an area that's the oldest district in Western Australia in Dawesville. A lot of people there move there to retire there and their whole point was that their, their primary residence would be their wealth, that's their primary wealth vehicle, that's where they hope to have most of their money and they might then downsize and, and also sell it. They're in a not dissimilar situation. They, they're, they're, we are all subject to the market, I think, and, and that's a reflection of where things are at. Anne talked about the time when she was uh, you know, starting out and I think we've always had this, a similar situation. The market's gone, fluctuated quite significantly. I think it's important to support a strong economy that leads to a strong housing market, gets people jobs where they can hopefully uh, afford, you know, that it, I think it's seven times now the average, mm. average wage to uh, average mortgage. I think it's important that a strong economy helps support that. That's what I think the, the, the government, the, the coalition's doing very well. Let's um, go back to Ryan now. We've got a bit of a chance to take a breather. Ryan, um, you've been listening to this. I mean, is that helpful advice from your point of view? It is, yes. Um, but I think as well there's a follow-on when you're having to build a house that far out, something you can afford. It's the follow-on costs, like uh, coming from Mandra to work daily in the CBD. It's over $20 on train fare and 800 k's in a car if you're driving. So you're servicing your car every three months. It's those added pressures that also add on to the mortgage payments that if you had been able to build a little bit closer, you might not have had to factor in. Or mm. the other option is that we take jobs to the outer suburbs. And I think we need to be making our outer suburbs more livable, uh, places where people can live, where they can raise their families, where they can uh, uh, you know, uh, go to parks, but also where they can work. It, there's an incredible difference between people who have to travel an hour, an hour and a half to get to work and those who work five or ten minutes from their homes. Okay, I'm going to go, we've got another question, a related question, we're going to go to that. It's about household debt and the burden of these high mortgages on people, which has been a big issue uh, in the survey. Sophie Thompson. Uh, good evening, Tony. Um, interest rates are at a record low, yet Australians are feeling the pressure of high household debt. What are some of the consequences for families going through this if interest rates begin to rise? Um, how will families be able to afford their mortgages? And is there anything that can be done now to help support people and families if this was to eventuate? Yeah, I'll start with Lani. This is a huge issue. And uh, as it comes through the survey, it's a much bigger issue, perhaps, than politicians have been calculating. Yeah, it is a huge issue. And, you know, interest rates, as you said, are at record lows. So the concern here for Ryan and, you know, other people who are struggling with their mortgages are how are they going to be able to afford um, things when interest rates continue to increase? 
face when they, you know, when we do see them to, to be on the up. And, you know, I did a story uh, a while ago about the stress that people were facing in relation to childcare. So many people, 40% of people were paying more than their mortgage on childcare costs. So, mm. you know, people are copying it from so many different areas. And I think we do really need to look at how we can help everyday Australians with the, the costs that they're really struggling with yeah. because eventually we will see interest rates increase again. Yeah, Dylan, what do you think? And uh, once again, you're looking down the barrel of uh, entering this world um, yeah. soon enough. Yeah, sooner rather, yeah, sooner rather than later. Um, yeah, it, it is, it's very difficult out there and I think that a lot of what happens, you know, I don't want to use the term of the Canberra bubble because I, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> the Canberra bubble. <laughs> yeah. um, but, you know, it, people are really struggling and I think that people can lose um, about everything that happens in Canberra and everything that happens in these discussions can really lose sight of the fact that, you know, you've got um, families that are really struggling out there, kids that are living uh, below the poverty line and, and the fact that, you know, Australia is one of the richest countries in the world. I, I think that, you know, we're seeing a, a level of, of austerity from, from the current government that's, that's really impacting families' bottom lines and they're really struggling. And there are everyday yeah. people that live in Canberra as well. There are everyday <laughs> people that live in Canberra it's as well. Not, it's, you know, there are real people yeah, in shout Canberra Shout out to too. all my people, yeah. all the friends in Canberra as well. I don't, yeah. Not you. <laughs> <laughs> Hannah, what do you think? Um, I think one of the big risks, obviously, is increasing homelessness. That people just cannot afford a roof mm. over heads and the impact yeah. on um, men, women and children, the most vulnerable. Um, why don't we start looking at some countries in the world that have invested properly into public housing stock and affordability mm. because we know that there are other nations who are doing much better than we are. Yeah, Zach, what do you think about that? And is there a plan if interest rates go up? Well, I, because I, um, if you look at the level of mortgage stress across the nation, um, what, what happens? Yeah, and well, that's a very good question. I represent, again, represent an area that has one of the highest rates of mortgage stress and mm. uh, 6210, which is the postcode that I, I help represent, uh, also where I mentioned Ryan lives, uh, is a very hard to get a loan there. So the, the, in, in the negative equity in those homes is, is a, a real problem. The cost of living is a huge issue in Western Australia. Bills have gone up immeasurably, $850 a year plus at the moment under current government, homelessness is a really big problem. I, I think there's a lot of these issues that are, the state governments have a very important role to play in trying to reduce in those burdens on people. And in Western Australia, I don't think that's occurred. I don't think that's occurred. And there's, there's an important, important role there to try and ease that, that cost of living pressure. Because it is, it's an issue that's affecting, I think, across the state, undoubtedly across the country. And I think states have... What a about a statewide plan to create affordable housing, for example, yeah. which is exactly what Hannah was talking about. Plenty of other countries have gotten a grip on this. Australia, not so much. Well, Western Australia is, uh, is, is uh, a recipient of, of the Key Start scheme, which was a, a government-funded interest rate, uh, low interest rate, or sort of moderate interest rate loan scheme funded by the government. Ryan's on it. Uh, it's, it's helped a lot of people in Western Australia get involved in their own in their first time, and I think it's something that should be looked at across the across the federation. Okay, uh, remember if you hear any doubtful claims on Kyoto, I'm not saying that was one. Uh, let us know on Twitter. Keep an eye on the <laughs> RMIT ABC Fact Check and the Conversation website for the results. Our next question comes from Virginia Plass. In Australia, we'd like to think that we're part of a classless society, but the Australia Talk survey revealed that over three quarters of us believe that the gap between rich and poor is too large. What implications does this have on the idea of Australia as a classless land of the fair go? Mm. Anna Lee, start with you. Uh, Virginia, was it, or Eugenia? Virginia. Virginia, I'm sorry, Virginia. Thank you for that, Virginia. You know, I'll tell you a story. When my parents came to Australia, um, 50 years ago, on June 9th, we celebrated 50 years in Australia. And my dad was an engineer in, in Egypt. And when he came to Australia, he couldn't work as an engineer. Uh, so he took a job on the factory floor and then he took a job as a bus driver. And, you know, that was a real blow to my family because of the, the status, the status of it, you know. And I remember growing up, my, my mum and my dad would always say, you know, in this country, we're all equal. In this country, the bus driver is the same as the, is the engineer. Right? And that was their way of kind of saying, yeah, we had to make this sacrifice, but it's okay because in this country, there's equality. And I guess that's kind of why I grew up thinking and believing, really, that equality and inequality, inequality in particular, was one of the, the things that we should all be fighting against. Um, this, you know, the thing that three quarters of people believe that the gap between the rich and poor is, is, is uh, and that gap is getting bigger, I think is really telling. 
And I think the first thing that we should be doing is raising New Start. I think the fact that New Start has been. The fact that, that New Start has been kept so low has really contributed to that. Really, really contributed to that. And I think uh, wage growth, slow wage growth, has also contributed to that. But they're not the only things. There are a whole range of other things, including the, the levels of household debt that we have. What I'm finding in, in Cowan, for example, is I'm, I'm really in touch with a lot of the uh, not-for-profits and the, the charitable organisations, and they're telling me that there is unprecedented demand for their services, mm. and it doesn't seem like it's going down. In, at one of those pantries had 6,000 boxes of food given to families in a single month. So I don't, I don't know that everyone realises just how tough it is out there for a lot of people and how much inequality is really biting. And when you have inequality, you also have a fractured society. It impacts on social harmony, it impacts on social cohesion, it impacts on the trust that we have between each other and in the institutions that govern us. And in every research that, that I've looked at, when you have an economy that is fractured, when you have more inequality, you have more social fracturing. And that's why we need to address this as a matter of urgency in Australia. Yep, Hannah, what do you think? Well, we have had this myth of, um, you know, the equal world. Uh, Aboriginal people certainly haven't uh, subscribed to when I grew up. Uh, we knew poverty, we knew homelessness, we knew police marching into people's homes. Um, uh, so I'm actually, in, in one sense, sort of happy that there's a dialogue about inequality happening because we really need to do something about it. We need to increase our human rights culture in Australia. We, we have no charter of human rights. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a crackdown on unions. Unions were big when I was a girl growing up and people had some, workers had more rights than they seem to do now. So um, I, I hope this is an awakening that's happening and that we can um, you know, look at ways that wealth can be redistributed there is obscene amounts of wealth and shocking amounts of, of poverty and suffering in Australia. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'm going to go to um, a related question and then bring in the other panellists. A question from Alphonse Malumba. Not all Australians share the benefit of prosperity. In some places like where I live in Balga, Mirabuka, Nodamara, unemployment is close to 21%. Youth unemployment is rife, and many older Australians doubt they could find another job. In WA, high electricity bills have caused a surge in, the, uh, a surge in disconnections. So my question is this. Can hard work really get you out of poverty? Start with Dylan. It's, it's been a big debate, this one, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's, it's a really big question, and I think, you know, we, we have people that are really struggling out there. Um, and again, coming off the, the point uh, just earlier about, about wealth di redistribution, is, you know, I, I don't think that anyone in this room, at least, or around the world, can say that a billionaire in this country, such as Gina Reinhart, works any more harder than the single parent who's working three jobs to try and put food on the table. And I really think that, you know, overall... You know, we've just had more tax breaks get handed to those types of people and a little bit to other people in the middle class, but not a lot. And we're not seeing any of these flow-down benefits. Again, it comes back to the big picture. Australia is a very prosperous country. You know, um, you know, when you take a good, long, hard look at ourselves, how are we treating people in this country? How are we treating people in this country? It's, it's not fair. Zach. Uh, look, the basic I, question, can hard work get you out of poverty? I, I think uh, it can. I think hard work and the opportunity to, to work, find a job and get up, it, it will. <laughs> uh, I, I, I have the, the, the personal experience myself, Alphonse, where I, you know, my family's come from a very difficult background, a, a, a struggling background, and I'm the, was the first, although I dropped out of uni, I was the first in my family to go to uni, and I'm a 32-year-old member of parliament for the Liberal Party. I think that we're in the greatest state and the greatest country in, in, in the world, and I think it's only because of the opportunities that we have to work hard that we can, we can get it going, and, and I think it can absolutely. You can absolutely help get out of poverty and get in a situation where you can you know, go on to achieve what you hope to. So you just heard um, Anne Ali uh, call for Newstart to be um, 
to be lifted. Well, so did John Howard, for that matter, and he's a ski on of your party. So what do you think about that idea? I, I think the Prime Minister's addressed that, and that's again, goes to the importance of having a stronger economy. Well, you address sure it by saying, no, we're not going to do it. Look, it's, a, it's about, well... <laughs> Without really explaining why. It's, a, it's a making sure there's a strong economy and making sure there's jobs. And that's mm. the most important thing, I think, is making sure mm. you've got a job. The Prime Minister says we live in a strong economy. Yeah. So why can't we raise the rate of new start to, we, boost, to boost the... the we well, we do live in the same time. We do. But raising the base of new start, that's going to go straight back into local jobs. It's going to go straight back into think, local business. Having, yeah, and I appreciate that point. I think having a, a, a strong economy, having lots of it. jobs, having lots of jobs uh, available for people is what absolutely has a, a larger multiplier effect. So, Zach, I, I know you may feel bound to follow what the Prime Minister says, but do you actually believe in it yourself? That's the big thing. Do I believe in having a strong economy? <laughs> no, do you believe in not raising new start? when people are suffering, when former Prime Minister John Howard says you should? Look, I think it's something that they should look at as part of the overall scheme for social security. It's something that should be looked at in depth. But again, I would still revert to the point that I think government should help people get a hand up and not a hand out. And that's, sort of, that's absolutely what I believe in. Okay. Hannah. Sorry. You've got to let people have their opinions, folks. OK. Hannah. So um, hard work and individual responsibility, personal responsibility, absolutely critical to success. I worked very hard through law school. I was um, homeless and out of education by 16, and fortunately there were special measures in Indigenous education. At the same time, um, there is structural inequality. There is wealth that is handed from generation that makes it really easier for um, you know, certain wealthy sections of society. So we, we can't um, you know, talk about um, hard work, personal responsibility without addressing structural inequality. Do right. you think this, this survey that we've just seen <laughs> is it sort of belling the cat on that issue? I mean, it's not something we talk about with, with figures around it. Now we can. Yeah, it's giving, um, giving a, a real voice to these issues. Very important. Lani. Yeah, look, I think there definitely are barriers for people to um, improve, you know, their situation in life. I think that we do need to do more to help our most disadvantaged people in our society. But, you know, I um, was made a ward of the state at age five. I was in kinship care and out of home care for a period in my life. And I, I, I do, and I did work very hard to get to where I was, but that wasn't without the help of other people. So I feel a responsibility to make sure that I'm giving back and I think we all have to do that in order to help our most disadvantaged people in society and 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 I think that we do need to look at the structural barriers and and we also we we do need to work hard as well I don't think they're I don't think it's dichotomy and do you want to pick up on that yeah I do um do you know I I've I've been through it all and I've certainly had difficult times in my life certainly not as difficult as some people that I meet um and I would say hard work is not enough. I've also, I have to recognise that I've also been incredibly fortunate to have been presented with some opportunities that I was able to take advantage of because I was healthy, because I was of sound mind, because I had support structures to do that. Hard work, we all know people who are lazy and incompetent and are very successful. How many of them are in the Can you name yeah. any of those? <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> and for each one of those people, you probably know 10 more who are hardworking, extremely intelligent, and just can't catch a break. Okay. Did you want to respond to that? Zach? Okay. Um, okay, you're watching a special edition of Q&A. Our next question goes to one of the most controversial issues in the Australia Talk survey. It comes from Mia Fraser. Changing the date of Australia Day is one of the most divisive questions in Australia talks. Do you personally believe we are likely to see the date change anytime soon? And what are likely to be barriers to making the change? Hannah, let's start with you. Well, there have been a number of uh, shy councils around Australia, and I think Fremantle, I often go down, they do not, <laughs> do not celebrate Australia Day anymore. Um, I don't know where it's going. There's a lot of people, obviously, um, from... Uh, this survey say very strongly actually they believe in Australia Day. Um, you know, for Aboriginal people, it still is a day of, um, of you know, there's reckoning to be had. You know, mm. we were dispossessed Aboriginal people without treaty, it was unlawful, um, and we haven't. Um, we Would have you not... personally like to see the day change? I think it needs to be changed. I think it's. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a, um, it would be a sign of a more reflective, uh, caring society, I believe. It was very divisive. Here's the figures. 
Thank you. 43% of people surveyed agreed Australia Day was on the wrong day. 40% disagreed, and the key is the ones who strongly disagreed. 28% strongly agree it should be moved. 30% strongly disagree. So it's a very divisive issue. Zach, what do you think? Well, I, I don't think the date should change at all. I think it's a, a reflection of a need to make sure there's a, a, ref, a much more reflective day, though, of, of looking at all contributions of all Australians, and that's Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal. I think that's the way forward for us. I don't think, to be perfectly frank, I don't think changing the date is going to change the, the rates of sexual abuse and violence that occur up in the Kimberley. Uh, well, I think we should be talking about those serious issues. We should be talking about those serious issues. No one's saying we can't. No, no, but my point is, though, my point is, though, that the change in the date, I appreciate that some, and again, it's divisive, that some want to change, some don't want to change, but I want it to be, I think it should be more reflective and inclusive on that date. On that data, it should encompass all contributions of all Australians, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal. So, when the uh, the nation's clearly divided on an issue like this, should there be a kind of public debate and maybe even a plebiscite? Um, for example, uh, you decided that was a or your side of politics decided that was a really good idea on same-sex marriage. I just wonder <laughs> if democracy demands, uh, in the same way, uh, that people should get to vote about this. Well, I, well, if that's up to the the community to to create that, that organisation if that's what they want to do mm. and start that conversation, I think, at this point in time. I, I think there are more pressing matters that should be attended to by, by government, like those issues that I just spoke about. Sure. Dylan. Well, I, I come from the Kimberley and I, yeah, the situation up there is not good. I, mm. Yeah, 100%. The date of Australia Day is something that doesn't come up very often in the community. There, there is bigger issues mm. at play. Uh, but I don't think that the date of Australia Day at the moment, I don't think that that will be the day that we celebrate Australia. I think that it will change within my lifetime, probably within the next decade or two. I think that, you know, 10 years ago, if you asked that question, uh, it would have been a much smaller percentage of Australians that didn't support changing the date, uh, that supported changing the date. And it's already coming up. So the, the tide's changing, and it is changing, and, it, you know, it's a democracy and it will eventually happen. Uh, I don't think that we can't have the debate, um, you know, the government like to drag this one out all the time, you know, we can walk uh, and chew gum at the same time. And we can change the date of Australia Day. Uh, and we can also talk about the rates of poverty. We can also talk about the structural uh, inequity. Not, but we're not. But we are. We're, we're, not well, we're certainly going to do that on this program, sure. Zach, that's for sure. <laughs> um, Lani, what do you think? I think that, uh, you know, there obviously are people who do feel hurt by the date of Australia Day, and there are people who feel very strongly in support of Australia Day remaining on the same day. I think we need to have a respectful national conversation about it. I think, you know, as the, the stats in the, um, you know, the survey showed, people are passionate on either side. So I think we just need to make sure that we're having a respectful date about it, a respectful debate about it mm. um, and, you know, and, and see whether we, we do change it or not. Yep. And what do you think? Were you surprised, by the way, that it was so yeah, finely balanced? Yeah, I was balanced? surprised that it was so, so divisive because I think that, you know, um, in the public sphere, you pro uh, mostly hear about on certain sections of the media only those who opposed, who are opposed to changing the date. You don't really hear that level of support for changing the date. I just think it's, it's, it's really sad that we are a nation where Aboriginal people are hurt and are hurting when we celebrate this day. I think we need to have the conversation, but I don't see a willingness to include the voices of our First Nations in conversations about whether it's about Australia Day or whether it's about those big issues that you're talking about, Zach. And yes, absolutely, they're big issues, but like Dylan said, you know, right now, this is hurting our First Nations people. If we want to heal as a nation and move forward as a nation, we cannot possibly do that without addressing this hurt. Well, I think there are sections of... <laughs> I think there are sections of the media that, you know, that do include other voices. So I agree with you that all maybe voices I'm reading, need to be... Maybe I'm reading just one section of the media too much. <laughs> you should be re yeah. reading the West Australian more. <laughs> yeah. um, but... <laughs> But there are sections of the media that do yeah. include all voices. OK. All right, let's move on, because we've got a lot to cover. Um, the next question is from Philip Pinto. Philip. Thank you, Tony, and the panel. Hi, Lanai. I read your columns in the West, and I find them riveting and discerning. <laughs> I'm a baby boomer, and I believe responsible for half the problems in the world. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I was raised up right. 
with a spare the rod and spoil the child approach. Do you think this country's liberal views on the family in terms of advocacy for changing the traditional family values is leading to current social and community issues by slowly fragmenting and eroding these values? Um, we might come back to you in a minute to find out a little more about uh, where you're coming from there, but uh, Lani, let's go to you. I think the gist of it is right. Once again, it was one of the big divisive issues, traditional yeah. family values. I'm, I'm very pleased you're reading my columns, Philip, so <laughs> thank you so much for that. Um, but I, I, you know, I don't think that I necessarily agree with that. I don't think that um, you know, the current debate that we're having is causing issues in traditional families or issues with the way that we raise our children. I think there are many different forms of family you know, uh, the, the um, Hilda's data that came out recently showed that I think 41% of family makeup are still um, a couple and a child. So, you know, and, and I just think we all grow up in different situations. Well, you certainly did. You grew I up in, in foster care well, uh, for the most Yeah, part. I was made a ward of the state at yeah. age five and lived with my grandparents, um, you know, for a bit and then and went out into out-of-home care. And, and, Does you it know, give you a different perspective on this? Well, absolutely, because I have four children of my own now, a five-year-old and three-year-old triplets and you know I um <laughs> <laughs> a round of applause yeah. and possibly a medal but yeah. anyway go ahead maybe just some more sleep yeah. um but uh but you know my motivation with them is to raise them as good people. And I think that that's what matters most, is how we're raising our next generation, not whether they grow up in a same-sex family or they grow up in a single mother family or a single father family. It's about the values that we're instilling in our children. So I, I, I just think, you know, people will be advocates of a traditional family, people will be advocates of, you know, a more diverse family. But I think we, we all need to raise our families how we want and care about the children that we're raising. So, Hannah. <laughs> Okay, great. This, this was another one of those ones um, that really split the uh, nation. The question was, uh, the decline of the traditional family has made... Has the decline of the traditional family made Australia worse? 46% um, agreed that the, this decline has made Australia worse. 37% uh, disagreed in the strongly... Uh, the people who felt strongly about this, 21% uh, strongly agree it's worth worse 19% strongly disagree. So again, in the strong opinions, it's very close. What do you think? Uh, again, and you can reflect on your own family life, actually, if you'd like. Yeah, sure. Um, look, I had a, a great-grandmother, a Noongar grandmother, Ethel Woyang, and, um, you know, I was just so lucky to have uh, the love of my grandmother. And in the Aboriginal world, um, your mother's sisters are also your mother. We don't have the nuclear... Western family and uh, our families have suffered from uh, the breaking down of the families through the mission um, genocidal history which lasted up till the you know 60s basically or even uh, since that time so um, you know the family um, the, the love of the children in the different um, the forms and the cultural ways is, is so um, is so important and what we're seeing though is this continual sort of uh, interruption and um, distress to Aboriginal families. Um, and you have a very different idea of what traditional family values mean. Well, that's right. We, um, you know, we have much more of a communal um, family um, uh, makeup and interest, um, but still, that's not being properly uh, recognised and respected. So many um, Aboriginal children are being uh, removed without proper family engagement actually, and sent into a life of uh, care. I did experience some institutional um, life growing up and it was um, not, um, not safe, not a good experience at all. Um, we're very worried about the numbers of Aboriginal children going into care and West Australia actually leads the way in terms of the removal of uh, children, Aboriginal children today. The numbers are much higher than they were during that terrible history of the stolen generation. And we are trying to fight for reforms that actually are about empowering Aboriginal communities, Aboriginal, keeping Aboriginal women and families safe and uh, having self-determination at the core to prevent um, this sort of um, breaking down of our families today. I might just quickly go back to our questioner. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Philip, uh, you could jump up if you, if you would mind. I'm just actually, uh, I just want to go back quickly to understand what it is you believe traditional family values to be. Oh, yes, I do, but... Uh, what, no, what do you think it is? How, do you, how would you describe traditional family values I think from your perspective? 
Traditional values, uh, family values for me would be something that's values that are more characteristic of, of a family that's more cohesive and also a bit of discipline. And that can be harsh in this day and age in a democratic sort of specter. But uh, traditionally, a family value for me would be values where the breakups in families are mi uh, minimized, for instance, through love and caring and all those sort of thing. And that's the way I see it. Thank you very much, Philip. Uh, Zach, what do you think? And why do you think this is such a divisive issue in the survey? I'm not, I'm not entirely sure, to be honest with you. I think, mm. it's a, I think a family unit is wherever there's love. I mean, that's, that's the whole thing to me. You know, I think whatever that looks like, that's the most important thing. And those are the values that should love and care and protection of those around you should be what you're in part on who are, those who are in your family and whatever the family looks like. And I think um, Hannah's right to raise the point. Uh, Ab Aboriginal children in Western Australia are 18 times more likely to be placed in out-of-home care than non-Aboriginal children. It's a huge number. And I think the idea of empowering Aboriginal women and Aboriginal communities in particular is really important to try and to stop that happening and, and reverse it. That's a reflection of that love that exists in, in those communities as well. And also, also Western Australia has very low permanency rates and adoption rates. So, you know, that makes a real big difference in a child's life as well in terms of getting permanency and stability. So, you know, there is a lot of work that needs to be done here. Dylan, what do you think? I agree wholeheartedly with everything that's been said on the panel. I think that, you know, often the traditional family values get brought out to say, you know, you've got a mum and a dad and this and that and nothing can change and if you do that, society's going to collapse and it hasn't happened and it never will. Um, I agree, it, it's all love, it's all care. Um, I'm extremely fortunate to come from a, a really great family. I've got two great parents, they're watching right now. Um, and, yeah. <laughs> um, and your grandma. And my grandmother <laughs> and, and family right around and I've been extremely lucky to have a, a strong family and, you know, that that is something that has benefited me and, and people that don't have that, um, you know, no, no fault of their own, um, it, it, it has a big impact in people's lives. So I don't disagree with that notion. Um, I think that there has been periods in history that, you know, traditional family values have been broken down, especially you know, when we talk about First Nations people, um, they've been broken down since, you know, January 26, 1788. Um, and uh, things have, have started to break up that way, but uh, things are not breaking up when it comes to things such as same-sex marriage and, and things like that. It's okay. definitely not. Um, Anne, I'll just quickly go to you on this. And uh, mm. Do you think that, that underlying this division is uh, religious beliefs? Um, oh, that's a, that's a tough one, Tony. I'm, I'm really, to be honest, not quite sure what traditional family values are mm. because I was the kind of mother that would have put a tracker on her sons if she could. Um, we have a very traditional kind of family set up. Um, I kind of do most of the cooking. My husband opens doors for me, but he's my third husband. Um, so... <laughs> <laughs> but I did good the third time, Tony, just let me say, because he's just sitting there. <laughs> um, so I'm not really quite sure what traditional families are. I'm also... I think these are very fluid concepts and they change with generations um, and, uh, and they change with, uh, with even... Um, uh, as, as, tra as traditional religious values change as well. I mean, we've seen that with the church. Uh, some churches are now becoming more accepting of marriage equality, performing uh, same-sex same um, marriages and so on and so forth. So, you know, I, I, I just... Um, I think these are fluid concepts and that, that we should be prepared to talk about them in fluid ways as well. OK, you're watching uh, Q&A. We're talking uh, about the big issues, uh, the ones that matter to Australians. Our next question comes from Peter Simons. Thank you. Dylan, you come from the hot northwest, and you will have seen the way that climate change is belting the, the, the wide brown land, the wide brown hot dry land that we love living in. Currently, politicians are abusing each other about bushfires. If you were Prime Minister and, and, and were dealing in a country that wants leadership on the really big issues, how would you handle the politics of the bushfire emergency, the drought emergency, the extinction emergency, and how they relate to the climate emergency? Now, Dylan, if you were Prime Minister... Um, now... <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we're leaping ahead a little bit, but that's OK. Um, I'm sure you've got ideas on these subjects anyway. Yeah, I, uh, climate change is an existential threat to humanity um, and, and civilization. Um, especially when we talk about people, you know, we've got, um, you know, the, the Torres Strait Islands are going to go underwater. 
um, the Pacific Islands are going to go underwater. These are existential threats to, to people around the world and here in Australia. Um, it is not political opinion to say that climate change hasn't contributed to these uh, horrific bushfires that we've seen in New South Wales and in Queensland, you know, like this isn't a, a political idea that has come out of nowhere. This is the Bureau of Meteorology. This is, you know, th this is our, these are our publicly funded institutions. Who, are we, who else are we supposed to believe? So climate change is an existential threat. Young people will disproportionately feel the impacts of climate change, and I think we've seen that in movements such as the school strike for climate action. Um, and, you know, it is a big issue. It is a huge issue, and I think that we need to actually have a government that first sort of acknowledges it, that doesn't have senators in the back thinking that the Bureau is tampering with temperature data. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's ridiculous. And we need a full, a, a, a revolution, in my opinion, to completely overhaul our energy generation system. We can start exporting, we can become a renewable energy powerhouse around the world. And that's the future Australia needs to be at the moment. You know, coal's our, one of our biggest exports. We can make that hydrogen, we can make that clean energy from this massive country with a whole heap of sun and, um, you know, we've got a huge coastline. We've got so many opportunities here, but narrow-minded um, people in Canberra and, and from particular sections of the media and some commentators, it really restricts what we can see and it's become really ideological where it shouldn't be because it's life on Earth. Just a quick one. Um, what did you... Okay. I knew I'd have to be quick to get that question in. Uh, just very briefly, though, um, what do you think of the uh, debate around whether or not you can talk about climate change while the bushfires are happening, while people are struggling for their lives and trying to save their properties, which was the essential political argument from both sides, both of the major parties, anyway? Yeah, I think that you can have extremes on both sides and you do need to be sensitive because people have just lost their lives and people have just lost their homes. Mm. Um, but I think you can. I mean, there was a tweet from the Bureau of Meteorology in New South Wales uh, the other day that said that this has been caused by climate change. So, you know, it, it, I don't think that there should ever be a time where you shouldn't bring up fact, especially when it's directly affecting Australians. You do need to be sensitive about it, mm. uh, but you can't, you can't put your head in the sand and pretend that it doesn't happen. And we'll talk about it when these bushfires are finished because the bushfire season hasn't even started. More bushfires are going to start. More people's lives are going to be lost, unfortunately. There's going to be a huge uh, refugee crisis due to climate change. And, you know, we've got a government that's, you know, our emissions are continuing to rise. It, it's kind of disgusting. Zach, um... <laughs> so you're a young uh, politician on the conservative side of politics. Still plenty of time to create your own opinions and to make your mark if you want to go a different path uh, to uh, some of your colleagues. How, what are you thinking about this? You, you mentioned climate change earlier. What do you think about the debate around it during the bushfire season, for example? Well, I think distinguishing it from the season itself, because you're right, it hasn't started, and especially in Western Australia, I think we're a week or two away from it kicking off. But I think the comments uh, when, they are, when there's people literally fleeing their homes and communities are under threat, when there's an active fire ground like that, I think calling the government things like arsonists uh, is probably unhelpful. And ultimately, what we should be doing is making sure that people are focused on, on getting out of that situation. So we, we make sure they leave those areas safe and that there's a recovery put in place. It, it doesn't mean that we have to have a conversation you know, just in winter. But what it does mean is that those comments shouldn't be insensitive and at a time when it's done to maximise political impact and, and ultimately, I think, actually does whatever cause or whatever sort of misguided uh, perspective they're having, it doesn't actually help them at all. It, I think we should make sure it's a, a conversation and, and whatever that looks like with you know, dignity and discipline, but it doesn't need to happen when people are literally fleeing, you know, got their go bag and out the door and running from a fire. Now, Dylan uh, referred to big ideas and one of the big ideas, I think you were actually borrowing from uh, some of what Ross Garner, the economist, uh, said on this program last week and has been saying that Australia could be a renewable energy superpower uh, if it chose to be, and it could use clean energy to start processing metals. So you, in Western Australia, for example, where you send huge quantities of iron ore to China, if you uh, use renewable energy in this, in this way that Garner was envisaging, you could be sending 
process metals, steel, mm. back to China. Um, would that be a good idea? And is that the sort of thing that requires major leadership from the very top of government at the federal level? I think uh, it doesn't necessarily require a top-down approach. I think it requires all of us together. It's a shared responsibility. Uh, to me, I, I represent, again, I'm going to keep going back to Mandra. Mandra has the highest rate per capita of solar panels on the roof. My, my district firmly believes in the idea of renewable energy. I think we should see much more of that take place across our cities. And yeah, I, I think there's a good opportunity to, to diversify our economy, and that might mean you know, having smelters here and, and put in, uh, you know, form steel back up to any export market, whatever that looks like. I think there is an absolutely an opportunity for, for cleaner energy. I think all of us want a cleaner planet. There's no one, no one, I don't think anyone disputes that. I, I think there's the idea of the renewables and what that looks like in, in Western Australia. We, are, we have a lot of opportunity here, a lot of resources, and I think it's something that's a very exciting future for us. I just want to hear from the other side of politics. Mm. And Ali, uh, brief answer, because we've got so many questions. Okay, to really brief, because what I want to do, Tony, is I want to tie in this answer to also answer some of the issues that Ryan raised and some of the issues that Sandra raised really early on. What I think we should be doing, Australia's complexity, economic complexity, Australia has fallen in the economic complexity in, um, index. It means that our economy is shrinking in terms of the diversity of things that we offer, where there is a real opportunity here for renewables to become part of Australia's economically complex system. I would like to see the outer suburbs delivering things like renewable hubs and precincts where we develop renewables, we do recycling. We don't recycle our glass in WA, right? We do recycling, we have a circular economy, we create then jobs in the outer suburbs for people like Ryan, so you're not travelling an hour and a half to get into work. We address issues of inequality, we have jobs for young people. This is the vision for Australia for our future, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you. Got to move on. The next question is from Jamana Al Shimari. The results from the ABC's Australia Talk Survey, the national survey, shows around 90% of participants do not trust politicians to tell the truth, if that truth will hurt them politically. The lack of credibility is incredibly prominent in the political views concerning the recent bushfire outbreak. Australian politics are supposed to represent the people. So why are our politicians lying to us in order to promote their own political ideologies? Um, Lani, <laughs> we'll start with you. At some point, I mean, there is this general sense that uh, politicians, in fact, 90% of, uh, mm -hmm. of those respondents believe that uh, politicians were prepared to lie if it was in their political interest to do so. Mm. Um, that's a pretty shocking statistic. Yeah. I think I've been in at the press gallery in Canberra since 2010, so I have viewed many politicians over that period of time, um, and I think that, you know, often they can be skilled at responding how they want to to a question. So I can see why that would be the case in the survey that 90% of people said that they don't trust them. I think, you know, we, we need to see politicians be more real and give genuine answers to things and, you know, advocate for policies that will really make a difference in people's lives in a genuine way. I think we do need to really see, you know, trust reinstalled in politics because, you know, we, it all works together. You know, what the public wants, what politicians want, it, it, it needs to be a symbiotic relationship. So I think that it is an issue that we need to fix. I'm going to hear from our non-politicians on this. So, Hannah, what do you think? Oh, we, we just had so many years of watching, you know, politicians depose prime ministers, and mm. we're, we're a bit jaded, really, <laughs> I think. Um, and uh, for Aboriginal people, it's a really hard fight. I mean, we didn't actually get land rights in West Australia, even though we were promised it by the Labor Party, unfortunately. The mining companies were so powerful in their campaign. Uh, we've been fighting just for a Deputy Aboriginal Children's Commissioner for over 10 years following the Gordon Inquiry, sparked by death of a young Aboriginal girl at the Lockridge campsite. Mm -hmm. And every time someone's in opposition, they say, oh yeah, we support that. But then when they get to um, government, they don't support it anymore. And this is for like Aboriginal kids who are in a really vulnerable um, situation in this state and we can't even get a commitment there, sadly. Dylan. I think that it does come down to the fact that we are living in a, a disconnected two-party system. I don't think that a two-party system necessarily has to be disconnected from reality, but I think it is very disconnected from reality at the moment. It's, it's concerning when you talk to a lot of Australians that aren't necessarily interested in politics, that don't follow politics, they might watch a few news bulletins before a federal election or a state election. 
and they can't really point out the difference. They don't know the difference between the Labor and the Liberal parties. Um, and they, they can't understand the difference between them. They think, you know, they're, they're both as bad as each other. They're both criminals. They're all liars. And that's something that, that you know, goes through all levels of, of Australia. And, and people genuinely do believe that. So I think that, you know, to, to, to the politicians on the panel and to the people listening as well, that, you know, just be genuine. Be honest to people. People will respect that. You might not. Um, win the news poll of the day, but overall people are going to respect your authenticity. Um, you know, all Australians from across the political spectrum love Bob Hawke, and I think that's because he showed a level of authenticity. Um, Australia liked that, and the poll from a lot of what we're seeing out of Canberra at the moment, um, you know, I've been fortunate enough to meet a few politicians, um, and, you know, from all, all sides of of politics and they're genuinely, you might be recruited by one genuinely of nice people. I'm not, I won't comment on that one. <laughs> no, no, of course um, not. But they're genuinely nice people. But I think that the, the face that gets put on in public sometimes can leave people feeling jaded, and I don't think that's good for democracy. Thank you very much. Let's move on to another challenging issue. Our next question comes from Alison Gibson. Good evening. Nine weeks ago, uh, my sister Jessica was killed in her home. Her husband has been charged with murder. My sister, like so many other women, especially Aboriginal women, got very little media attention. I'd been interviewed and photographed days after the event, but the stories were not run. Instead, pages and pages, front and back, in the West Australian was about football. Why isn't mainstream mass media shining a light on these unnecessary and preventable deaths? Alison, we might come back to you. Okay. <laughs> Hannah, start with you. So one Australian woman is being killed every week and uh, we know for Aboriginal women this is much higher. Your sister was one of the victims. And why is football, you know, and sports so much a, a more a priority? Um, there is so much suffering to the families, the children who are, are being left behind as orphans. Um, this is the most serious human rights situation, I believe, in our country and we have to do something about it. And the UN has told us clearly what we need to do. We've been reviewed by the uh, Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women just last year. We do need national legislation on violence against women. And we absolutely need to increase our commitments to Indigenous women who are about 18 times more likely as mothers to be murdered in this state and who are failed routinely by the justice system and by the statutory departments that have those responsibilities. We as Aboriginal women have been raising our voices for decades and it's time that we were properly heard. So, can I just ask... <laughs> thank you. Can I just ask, what, what do you think is actually going on? I mean, do you think it's elements of old racist attitudes that mean that people are disinterested? They see this sort of thing isn't news, won't sell newspapers or whatever. I mean, what is it that's going on, do you think, um, when you hear a story like that? There is some, some issue here about whose lives matter, you know, and that for Indigenous women and, and for non-Indigenous women that our lives aren't being valued enough or that we're in denial about what's actually happening in this country. But, you know, I think all the evidence is there now. And uh, it's time that we all take the blinkers off and, and demand accountability, starting from the top with our governments. Lani, what do you think? It's uh, yeah. your newspaper they're talking about, obviously. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm so sorry about your sister, firstly. I, I think, you know, it's horrible that, that your family has had to go through that, and, and I'm really sorry about that. Um, I would say that, you know, <laughs> we do care about those issues. You know, we did a campaign, Kill or Be Killed, um, where Annabelle Hennessy, you know, wrote on the case of Jodie Gore, and that resulted in her being released from prison because she was subject to domestic violence. She was jailed um, for, you know, for killing her partner, which was deemed to be in self-defence. So, you know, through the vision of our editor who backed that campaign, you know, we really shone a light on that. And I think that you are right, that there does need to be more of those stories in the media. As we have heard the statistics, there is one woman that dies every week from domestic violence and personally I mean that's something that I really care about and have reported on a lot so you know I, I think that um, like I said I, 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 it's horrible what is going on and it's horrible what happened to your sister and I think that I agree with you we do need to report on those stories more but I would draw and you know attention to the example of 
some great reporting that we have had that in our is, newspaper. That is absolutely true. Uh, Hannah would like to respond to that. Um, yes, because I, I brought that case, of Jodie's case. Jodie is my niece, um, Kia's auntie, and I brought that case. I only found out about it um, late last year, and I brought it to many journalists, including Annabel Hennessy, who finally raised it. But the fact is that Jodie had been in jail for over four years. She was an Aboriginal woman who'd experienced two decades of violence and abuse, and she had the most horrific and racist treatment by the criminal justice system. System that treated her as a perpetrator, that sentenced her to murder, a 12-year sentence with no parole, even though she had life-threatening health conditions. So it wasn't the benevolence necessarily of the West, but I'm ever grateful, as is Jodie, that the West campaign got on board, but we need to see it more often. And I agree with you, Alison, that there wasn't enough focus you know, on what happened, really, and, and, it, and it isn't. I will go back to Alison, because she put her hand up. Do you want to just jump up, Alison? Um, do you want to respond to that? Um, just that I think we need to start looking at community attitudes and our country loves sport but when we get more than five pages front and back about football rather than important matters like this um, where I'm actually interviewed and photographed and stories don't get a mention where vigils are held that attract hundreds of people and they still don't make the papers, um, I think something's wrong. Okay, we'll take that as a comment because we've got to go to our last question. <laughs> Um, it comes from, thank you very much, it comes from, we're running out of time, I'm sorry about that, it comes from Alyssa Lovering. The Australia Talk survey found that 70% say they have not personally experienced discrimination. Perhaps a more telling question would have been to ask people if they have personally witnessed discrimination. What do you think people should do if they witness discrimination? Zach, we'll start with you. I think you probably wanted to pick up on the last uh, question as well, so go ahead. If I can, I, yep. and obviously um, I have to say, Alison, I'm very sorry what happened to Jessica. That's a horrible thing and, and appreciate you raising it here on this platform. There's not a person in politics, regardless of the side, and indeed in the media that I've met, that is not something that they, this is not something they don't care about. They, they desperately care about this and want to try and make the world a, a better place. And there are committed journalists, I think, at, at when I talked about the, the West, there's committed journalists in the West that I know about who absolutely worry about this. And I think it's a reflection of the work of Dr. McGlade, but others who want to make sure they raise the profile of this issue. Uh, we do it in Parliament on a regular basis. So I think it's really important that we keep having those conversations and raising that. It's, it's vitally important. And, and the question that was just raised. Discrimination. Yeah. I, I think it's important to call it out. Okay, uh, Dylan. Exactly, call it out. Um, everything, especially um, you know, when it comes to, to gender discrimination. Um, you know, and especially when it comes to um, being in a privileged position. Um, you know, if you are a, a white male, um, you know, call it out when you see it. Um, people, you know, so often will say um, derogatory comments off the cuff, and if you just ask them, why do you think that? they'll all of a sudden take a big step back and go, whoa, hang on, it makes them think for a second. And it makes them think and it makes them question themselves. So I think genuinely speak up because it happens far too often in this country. Um, gender discrimination, race discrimination, um, discrimination based on your, your sex or your, um, your, your gender or your sexuality. And it, it, it is wrong and it, it is up to people that are, that are in those privileged positions, unfortunately at the moment, um, we, we do need to speak up. Um, especially around our peers and around our mates, uh, because that's where a lot of this, these attitudes uh, fester. And if, if someone brings up that attitude and it's, it's not counted and it's not challenged, um, it become, it, there's a perception that it, that it is normal and, okay. and it's not. Thank you. Um, and Ali. Um, thank you. And, and it was really interesting in the survey that people who said they've never experienced racism and but then said you know they, they believe that Australia is racism and discrimination and that's because there's a big difference between the racist who'll call your office or send you a lovely email or even take the time to write you a letter and post it um, or come to your face uh, is a very different kind of racism that very direct racism very different kind of racism to the structural discrimination and structural racism the invisible kind that comes back to the questions uh, that, that, that Alfonso was talking about, about opportunity and hard work and all of those things. Definitely, yes, we need to call it out. But I think more than calling it out, I think we really need to have a conversation in Australia about where we are at with discrimination and racism. Uh, and, you know, there's a saying that, you know, if your head is ugly, don't blame the mirror. 
So it's really, <laughs> it's really hard. It's really hard to be introspective about the ugly parts of us, the ugly parts of our society, the things that aren't so nice. It's difficult. It is difficult to be introspective about that. But you know what, Australia, we need to move on as a country. We need to heal with our First Nations people. And we cannot do that. We simply cannot do that until we really address structural and direct racism and discrimination. Okay, Lani. Yeah, look, I agree, and I think that we do need to call it out and we do need to have more conversations about it. You know, I would draw everyone's attention to a story that we did the other day on Sue Lyons, the Labor senator, and her granddaughter, who says that she had been experiencing discrimination. So I think we need more stories like that as well, and we need to tell the stories of people who are experiencing discrimination, because I do think that it does occur a lot more than, than we talk about. Um, and I think it's easier for people to say, oh, no, I've never experienced discrimination, but when they actually dig a little bit deeper and look a little bit further, they, they probably have or know someone else that has. So I think that we need to talk about it more. Okay, and our last word to you. Um, racism is really, um, it's, it's killing Aboriginal people. Mm. Let, let's be honest, there are Aboriginal people who are, are dying at the hands of police. They're dying because they can't get treated in a hospital when they're really ill. Aboriginal people are experiencing some sort of, you know, subconscious or stereotyping racism. It's just become so prevalent. People are talking about it. Uh, again, this has been a big issue before the United Nations. We've been reviewed by the Committee on Discrimination who has acknowledged that it's on the rise in Australia and that we don't seem to have national uh, policies that are properly resourced to have the conversations and we have a constitution that is bereft of protection. If anything, it possibly um, allows discrimination to happen. So we have a lot of work to do. Very briefly, police killings, deaths in custody, all those years after the Royal Commission still happening. It's shocking, you know, we're 30 years after practically the Royal, Com um, the Royal Commission into Deaths in Custody. When I was a young person, Aboriginal men were dying at a weekly rate. Now it's Aboriginal women um, being shot. The funeral for Joyce Clark, who was mentally ill, her family called triple zero for help and she was uh, shot in Geraldton. We want answers there. We want answers for the death of Shadina Wynne in Victoria Park, who was um, tackled and manhandled by the police violently before she subsequently died. We've had a historic apology, but we're not talking about human rights training for the police, even though we've actually got an offer from the United Nations Human Rights Commission to do that work. Everyone wants to go with the light stuff of sort of cultural awareness training. Well, that's not um, that is not sufficient and we have to, you know, really uh, become um, more comfortable with a human rights dialogue and our commitments. We're a member of the council now. Thank you very much, Hannah. That's all we have time for tonight. Please thank our panel, Dylan Storer, Zach Kirkup, Hannah McGlade, Lani Scar and Ann Ali. A big round of applause also for this wonderful West Australian audience. Go ahead. Thank you very much. You can continue the discussion on Facebook and Twitter. Now, next week on Q&A, we shift the focus to international affairs with the former US ambassador to the United Nations, Samantha Power. The Labor Party's shadow minister for education, Tanya Plibersek, Israeli parliamentarian, Tamar Zandberg, the foreign editor of the Australian newspaper, Greg Sheridan, and James Brown from the US Study Centre. Until next Monday, good night.